So hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, you may have noticed that I am not Melanie Tanata, who um, was intending to lead this workshop. I am Shannon Merchant. I'm the Director of Career Development here at the Evans School. And um, Melanie is out sick. Um, so I am happy. I was happy to be able to jump in and uh, take over leading this workshop. Um, this is a fun topic for me, and I'm excited to spend some time with you all today and hopefully answer all of your questions. Um, also joined today by our career development graduate assistant, Shahid, who is going to be leading a few of the portions um, of it and is helping me out with some of the Zoom management and slide sharing. So, uh, and there's Shahid. So let's go ahead and start things off with a land acknowledgement. This is something that our career team finds really important and we try to do and we try to begin all of our programs um, with this acknowledgement. So starting off by acknowledging the Coast Salish people and the Duwamish people upon whose lands here in Seattle and at the University of Washington where we live, study, meet and work. Um, we continue, we encourage you to continue deepening your own understanding of whose land you reside uh, and work on, as well as the history um, around this, not only here in Seattle, um, but, but really looking across our region um, and understanding who are the tribes and nations that uh, allow us to meet and gather on their lands uh, in our community. Monday this week was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and it was a day where we were able to spend time in reflection, hopefully in service, really coming to terms and um, acknowledging, remembering the racial justice um, work that has been done in this country, while also acknowledging how much more work is to be done. Um, when we are thinking about career building, career building topics, this is something that we need to also continue to think about and acknowledge um, this time because employment, education, and career development continue to exist within a landscape that is riddled with social and economic injustices, both in the past and ongoing in our present. Um, we can see that there are systems of power and privilege that are deeply rooted in race that continue to exist in modern workspaces and institutions um, and acknowledge what is our responsibility as people where we currently are thinking about our positionality and the power that we and influence that we may each hold um, to identify and change these things in the spaces where we exist. Um, we also recognize this duty to give honor through our work um, to those who came before us, uh, for those who have done this work and, and um, gotten us to where we are today, while we continue to stand up for racial and social justice every single day. So with that acknowledgement, now I'll share a little bit about what to expect today. So you joined because you are hoping to learn how can you be building your Evans School resume. So for our agenda, we're gonna um, talk about how can you get started? What's this anatomy of the job description? How can you use that as you're thinking about your own resume? Then we're gonna get into a little bit more nuts and bolts, um, tips, thinking about resume sections, thinking about how you can compile your information, what that looks like. Um, we're going to answer some frequently asked questions, share some additional resources, and have Q&A. For the session today, um, I am going to be prompting you to do some kind of personal reflection. I think that personal and professional journaling can actually be really helpful. Um, and so we've got that interspersed as well as I'm going to be asking you to participate through chat. Um, I have a few polls as well. So before I have you respond to this question in the chat, I am actually just going to launch a quick little poll right now. 
um, so that I can get a sense of who's in the room. This workshop was open to students in all of our degree programs here at the Evans School, our MPA, EMPA, and PhD. Um, and depending on who's here, that may change a little bit of some of the things I focus on. So it looks like everyone has participated. And it actually looks like 100% of the participants today are from the MPA program. So that is helpful uh, for me to know. The other question that I wanted to find out from you all about resumes is what is your immediate primary purpose for building your resume? Are you seeking an internship? Are you thinking about full-time employment? Maybe looking ahead to post-graduation. Maybe your immediate need is, I need a part-time job. If it's an internship, great, but also just really thinking about employment. Or maybe you're not at a point where you have to be thinking about either of those things and you're just gathering information for the future. So we've got about 88% of people who have responded. So just give it maybe five more seconds. I think that's pretty much everyone. All right. So it uh, looks like we're split um, between internship and full-time employment. So that's telling me we've got people who are at different stages um, in their career journey here at the Evans School. So I will keep that in mind as we are talking about resumes and some of the examples that I may be sharing. Okay, so I am going to ask for a little bit of this chat participation at the beginning. I know you may be eating lunch, so I'm not going to be asking for too much of this chat participation. But as we get started, when you think of resumes, when you think of resume writing, what in your mind, what is the purpose of a resume? This is a really basic question, but I think this is a really good place for us to start. So if you could share your thoughts in the chat box. What is purpose of a resume? Yeah, highlighting experiences, accomplishments, skills, to get an interview, talking about employers, preparing for a career, presenting yourself as a candidate. Yeah, these are all, these are great answers. Love to see the way that you are all thinking about resumes, this is great. So ultimately, when you are putting together a resume, this is an external facing document. So as you all were talking about, it is something that is being presented to employers, to professionals, to people in the field, um, highlighting your skills and experiences. But at the end of the day, the goal of the resume is to get yourself an interview. Ultimately, if you're submitting something for uh, a resume for something, that goal is to secure whatever that position or that fellowship or that award is, ultimately. And yet, a resume is not the only thing that's going to get you there. The resume is this first step that is probably going to get you to this middle step, which is an interview. Then in that interview, that's where you get to share more of this detail about who are you? Who are you as it fits with this position? What can you bring to the table here? How is that something that works with the organization? So that, the interview, is what's going to get you the job or the internship. The resume itself is going to get you to the interview. So with that in mind, we want to think about, okay, how can you get started? So if you're thinking about this resume as this marketing document, this external facing document, there's a few things that you need to do as you're getting started. There's going to be a requirement around some of this internal personal reflection. So really thinking about what is my value add? What am I bringing to this person? What are the things that I want to highlight as so many of you identified? Really thinking about how do I wanna communicate my experience? What are my skills? What are my experiences? And how have those things prepared me for and relate to what I wanna do next? 
So definitely there's going to be a lot of that internal reflection. As you're preparing, though, you also want to think about how are you going to stay organized? So in thinking about this, um, before you even start um, writing that resume, you're probably going to want to think about how can I be organizing my documents? You're going to have multiple versions of your resume. You're probably going to be submitting a certain resume or a certain cover letter um, for each individual position that you may be applying for. So my tip would be use a naming convention you know, include your last name because you're not the only person seeing this resume. Um, so I would recommend doing a naming convention, something like last name and then maybe space or underscore or whatever. Um, and then the organization and perhaps the position title. That way, when you are looking back through all of your files, when you get called for that interview, that may be two weeks later, three weeks later, perhaps longer, depending on who you're applying for, you can reference back, oh, what even was this job? How did I sell myself? What did this person see about me? So having that naming convention and thinking about how can you have a tracking system? So ensuring that you are saving those job descriptions, not just pulling that URL link because that will often not be accessible anymore um, once the application period has closed, but thinking about how am I downloading this job description? How can I save it so that I can have that for my own files? And then the third thing you would wanna do as you're thinking about getting started, is start with the vacancy announcement. We're gonna go into a lot more detail about how you can make sure you're leveraging that announcement within your own resume writing. Um, we also, this is how do you build your Evans School resume? So with that first point, thinking about what's your own value add, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna give some suggestions for things to reflect on from your Evans School experience, in addition to really thinking about who are you as a person? Who are you pre-Evans? What do you have in addition to these things that you've been learning and building and growing as a student? Okay, I know, this slide is a lot. I know that there's a lot of text here. But as you are thinking about the job description, really recognize this employer has provided a roadmap telling you exactly what they're looking for. Um, and there are some very common elements to resume or to job descriptions that you're going to see in almost every single thing. And when you are thinking about resume writing, there are different uses that you can take from each of these sections. I have dropped a link in the chat to a job description so that we can all kind of like have a, a, a shared point of reference. Um, but I'm going to go through this table to share a little bit more about these different pieces that you can expect to see in a fairly standard job application and how to think about how can you use that section? How can you flip that around when you are building your own resume? So the very top of the job description, obviously we're gonna see who is the employer, the organization or department. This can be helpful because it's often going to have like a little description, who are we, what do we do? Um, this may be helpful when you are trying to think about what is my organizational or cultural fit? with this organization? Is this a place that I'm actually interested in? But beyond that, maybe seeing some of the values, thinking about how those values can be reflected in your own resume, you're probably not gonna have to pull too much from that section for the actual resume. Next, it's often gonna see the logistics. So um, where this job is located, the department or division. What I find most helpful about this information and what you're gonna see if you actually look at this job link that I dropped here, this is often where it's gonna tell you very specifically what department is this position housed within. Oftentimes it will tell you what is the position title that this role reports to. 
And this can be helpful when you are trying to get a sense of like, this is a big organization. This is a department of commerce. And it's not telling me a specific agency that this policy analyst is a part of. Um, this is where you're gonna start to get more of that detail. It's also a place where you can start to judge where does this position fall within the hierarchy of the roles here? Because you can often tell that by the title that this person reports to, by whoever is that direct supervisor. That can also be helpful because they're often not gonna give you a name for a person um, who's gonna be doing the hiring, but you can take that job title that is there. So I think for this um, King County position that I dropped to you, we can see the position reports to the lead impact and evaluation manager. This is where you can hop onto the organization's website, look for a staff list, go onto LinkedIn, see if you can find this person's name. It's gonna be useful when you're addressing your cover letter. It's also gonna be useful though, if you wanted to reach out to somebody for an informational interview to find out even a little bit more about the job before you apply or in the process of applying. Okay, so that's all good information to know, but really where we're going to get into the heart of the job description and the heart of what you're going to need when you're thinking about how to leverage this job description on your own resume is the job overview responsibilities and qualifications sections. You're going to see a lot of information across all of these. So when you're thinking about your resume, you want your resume to be a reflection of what they have told you they're looking for. And yet, your resume is often going to be one, maybe two pages long. You are not going to be able to reflect every single thing in your job description, nor would I expect you to. So really thinking about how do you prioritize your time and your focus here? I recommend that you take a look at that job overview. This is like the big picture summary of what you're gonna be doing. It is the 40,000 foot uh, summary. This is where you're gonna to wanna to make sure a cover letter helps you connect to that very big picture point of view, why you're interested, why you think you would be a good fit. This is also where you can start to see some themes coming up. And those are probably the themes that often a lot of your skills, experiences, or expertise are related to that you're really going to want to make sure you're focusing on. Because then when you get into the responsibilities list, this is what can be very, very, very long. The responsibilities list is a good place to be identifying some vocabulary that you can make sure is reflected in your own descriptions of what you have been doing in your past experiences, the skills that you have, what you bring to the table. However, you are not gonna be able to address every single responsibility and honestly, don't even try. Really think about how can you merge this big picture point of view and pull the repeating themes and patterns that are skill related or subject matter expertise related that you can see through those responsibilities into your own bullet points and descriptions of what you've done in the past. That qualification section, this is the other part that I would really be focusing on. So really focusing on that big picture, try to get that big picture, those skills they're talking about reflected through your descriptions of experiences and really try to get those qualifications highlighted and then use some of the vocabulary that you're seeing from the responsibilities. When you're looking at qualifications, you're often gonna see minimum or required, and then you're gonna also see um, preferred. You should mostly be focusing on the required um, or minimum qualifications. If you feel like you meet 60% um, or more of those required qualifications, this is a position you should apply for. This is a position you're qualified for. Anything above that, any of those preferred qualifications, that's extra. So if you have those preferred qualifications, make sure that you highlight them, but make sure those required ones are very clearly seen and evidenced on your resume because that's what's gonna get you past the screening uh, to actually get that interview. With the benefits and salary information um, and the legal disclosures, 
This is information that is hopefully going to be included in job descriptions. It's not always going to be included in job descriptions. Um, so with salary, um, if it is there, if it's a public position, it should be included. You're going to see a really big salary range. I think that KCHA example that I dropped there has like a $20,000 range. You can actually do a little bit more research into what are the specific salary bands within that range. And those bands are often very prescribed, very dependent on the number of years experience, the education level um, that you're bringing in. So there's absolutely room for negotiation there, but that's helpful. For international students, um, if they don't have information about immigration or visa sponsorship, this is something that is helpful to ask about earlier on in the process so that you don't spend a lot of time wasting your own time or that employers if they aren't able to hire international students. I see a question in the chat from Oliver about, can I repeat that? So yes, if you meet 60% or more of the required qualifications, I would recommend that you go ahead and apply for that position. Um, and um, that may be things like maybe they say um, two to four years of professional experience, and maybe you came straight from undergraduate to graduate school. So you wouldn't really necessarily personally consider that you have two to four years, but you meet every single other thing in that list, you are still qualified and you should still apply because we never know exactly how an organization calculates some of those numbers. So that's why I would say 60% or more of those required qualifications means that you are qualified and should apply. So with this next slide, when you're thinking about this job description, these are some of the things that I think can be really helpful when you're first getting started, when you're kind of first annotating um, a job description. I think it can be helpful maybe one or two times to print it off and go through this process. And then eventually the more you get used to it, the faster you can do it and you don't necessarily have to um, print it off and like physically annotate it every single time. But when you're looking at that job description, you know, again, look for repetition of certain words or themes. These are probably things that are gonna be really important. Pay attention to the order of information. Most important information typically is something that is closer to the top within sections and across the whole description itself. Think about what are those action verbs? What are those skills that they're looking for? Those are things that are separate from subject matter themes or topics. You can be qualified for a lot of things, but for different reasons. Maybe you have specific technical or hard skills that are related or transferable skills, or perhaps you bring a depth of subject matter expertise on a certain policy topic. So when you are thinking about what does it mean for me when I'm looking at this, I'm going to drop some of these questions that, again, I think are going to be helpful as you're thinking about maybe some reflections and personal journaling as you're um, getting started in this process. From the job description, what seems to be important to that employer? What skills are going to help me thrive in this role? Maybe they're listed or not. Maybe they're skills that you personally have. It's not necessarily the vocabulary that they're using in the job description, but you know that this is something that you can bring to the table that will help you succeed, again, in that 40,000 foot kind of overview summary level of what they need this job to be doing. And then thinking about what of my skills are in development, what skills do I already have, and what in this job description is gonna be a bit of a stretch for me. These are things that you would want to be reflecting on because, again, you're trying to get the resume to get you to the interview and then recognizing these are probably going to be some of these questions that are going to come up in the interview. So it's helpful for you to actually start thinking about these things when you're in the process of application before you get to that interview stage. So if we go to the next slide, 
one of the suggestions um, that we gave here to kind of help identify some of these themes and patterns or words that might stand out, you can use a word cloud. Um, we included an example, tagcrowd.com on the last slide. Um, and that is actually the um, place that I went to pull this particular word cloud for that King County program evaluation analyst job. So we can see here, it just kind of cuts through some of the noise and helps us see what are the things that are coming up at the moment. And these are probably areas that we should focus on. So I threw a lot of information out there right now. I wanna take a second and I wanna pause for questions. What questions came up or is there anything that you would like me to clarify related to what we just talked about? Feel free, you can drop it in the chat or you can always unmute yourself and just ask the question if that's easier. I have a question. Um, I think that I have historically thought of my resume as something that like doesn't change depending on what I'm applying to and then like my cover letter changes. Um, and then recently I had a meeting with Melanie and we talked about like having kind of an a running list resume that I kind of tailor depending on the job I'm applying to. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was wondering if you could speak more to like how much should each resume be different depending on the job? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Mary, for asking that. So um, yes, we are always going to tell you that you should tailor your application materials for a role. Realistically and practically, um, I know that doing that takes time. You might not always have a ton of time. And so some of the ways that you can tailor information on your resume, um, we're actually going to get into a little bit of this in the next section, but um, some of the ways you can think about that, maybe you don't need to make huge, massive edits. But just like we were talking about looking at that job description and pulling key words or key vocabulary from it, that can be a really easy way to actually make some of those adjustments so that when an employer is looking at your resume, they were thinking in a certain way about what they needed, and that's how they wrote the job description. And so when they see your resume and your resume that's reflecting and mirroring that same language, that's identifying those skills, they think in their head, oh, this person is a perfect match for what I need. So for example, maybe in the job description, they say, um, we need somebody with um, uh, great public speaking skills and ability to pull together presentations. Perhaps on your resume, you have a bullet point from a past experience where you say, you know, communicated with students and various audiences to teach and train. Those are the same things. And yet they are specifically calling out a type of communication, which is public speaking and presentations. So making a small tweak in your own description to say um, uh, presented training and education by engaging in public speaking to a variety of audiences is the exact same thing as what you had said before. Now it's mirroring that same language. So that is one of the most simple things that I think you can do in terms of tailoring. It's just like tweaking and hopefully you don't even have to rewrite. Hopefully you can just replace a word without even having to reorganize the structure of that particular bullet point. Um, sometimes it may just be copying and pasting and moving some of your sections around so that you have your most important and most relevant information that connects to that job closer to the top of the resume as opposed to the bottom, which actually moves straight into our next section. Um, so this next section, I am going to be going into some of those strategies. So hopefully it gives maybe a couple more examples of how you can be doing that as well. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Oh, great. Um, 
I see a question in the chat about international students and visa sponsorship. I will circle back to that again. Um, and um, so I see your question. I'm just, I'm uh, kind of putting a pin in it so we can come back to it again. Okay, so when we're actually now, we're thinking about that pre-work, we thought about the job description, now we're actually at your resume. It is important to remember, a resume is a marketing document. Yes, it is a marketing document that is full of facts about you. What have you done? What skills do you have? But at the end of the day, this is a piece of persuasive writing. So that's where when we talk about tailoring your resume, matching that vocabulary, and then also thinking about how are you presenting this information, maybe in the way that you organize it, or the order that you're putting things in. This is where resumes get to be a little bit more like a puzzle and can be fairly fluid once you have that solid base uh, ready to go. So there's a few things that you're always gonna wanna have on your resume. You need your contact information. I know it feels dumb that I'm saying this right now. You would be surprised that I have received resumes that have a person's name and then don't have a phone number or an email address way to contact them. So you need to make sure that you include that. Um, it's not necessary to include a mailing address on your resume anymore. If you're applying for somewhere locally, or even if you're applying for somewhere across the country, sometimes people will include like a city state location because they want somebody to know they're a local candidate or they're a long distance candidate. If you don't even want to provide that information, that's fine name, email, and phone number are the minimum contact information that you should have. Anything else is just extra. But when you're thinking about organization, you wanna make sure that you're organizing things in a way that makes sense for your content. So all of you are currently in school. So the education that you're currently pursuing is probably one of your strongest qualifications for whatever position you're going to be applying for next, whether that's an internship or a full-time job. So when you're a current student or a recent graduate, I always recommend that actually education be fairly close to the top of the resume. The farther away from schooling that you get, the more likely that your experiences are going to be your strongest qualifier for a job. And that's when we start to see education push down back toward the bottom of the resume. But other things that you can think about, experience is a very broad term. Experience at the end of the day is what have you been doing? It matters less if experience is academic, if it was paid, if it was volunteer, if it was extracurricular. So you can start to think about what makes sense for the way that you are going to group your experiences? Maybe you have a handful of paid work experiences that are relevant to what you want to do next, but then a bunch of them that are not. And maybe you also have some volunteering experiences or academic things that also are relevant. So think about how can you group those things together in an experience section and then pull out and push down the resume the things that you don't really think need to be the first um, thing that that employer sees. So that may be organizing things into a relevant experience section and an additional experience section that's all the way at the bottom. You might also think, you know, I don't have a lot of internship work or research experiences in the field that I want to go to, but I've done a lot of projects here at the Evans School that show my qualifications related to this skill area or this policy topic. Projects can be their own section. You don't have to include projects under education or an experience. And that gives you a little bit more flexibility with the way that you would format that information because a project may not have a formal employer or a formal job title. Um, and so pulling it into its own section is a good way to still highlight that, but to be free of some of the formatting constraints that you might be facing if you were trying to fit it into a different section. Other roles on resumes, things should be in reverse chronological order. So starting with your most recent experience and working your way backwards to the oldest things. This also is the same thing with your education. Start with your highest degree work your way backwards. The reason being, 
what you're doing most recently is hopefully most relevant to what you want to do next. You can also think about putting sections in order of importance. So again, resumes, everything's a puzzle. It can all be shifted around. There's not one single format that a resume has to follow. So when you are thinking about this, and again, like when you're preparing, doing some of this reflection or possibly journaling, um, ask yourself these questions. What does the content on my resume show and tell about me? If you have just laid out just the facts that this is what I've done, you're not really thinking of this document as a marketing document and how do you wanna be seen in the future? What do you want an employer to see or notice about you? So thinking about how are you trying to position yourself and how can you be doing that through the language that you're choosing in your descriptions or even the organization and titles of your sections. The next three slides, I'm just gonna show some various examples of formatting. All of these are available in our Evans School resume guide, um, which I can drop a link to. Um, that might just take me a second and I'm trying to talk. So um, I'll do that in a minute. Rosie, I see you have a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and maybe these examples will help, but I was wondering about the coursework in education. I've not um, previously included specific classes that I took aside from in the education, just like the degree that I got or the degree mm -hmm. that I'm doing. So um, yeah, I guess how would you recommend, and maybe we can just look through the examples of mm -hmm. specific yeah. classes that I took. Um, that would be relevant to the job? Is that kind of what is? Yeah. Good? So that's a great question. There are various ways that you can think about how to show your coursework. And I would say the question is, what are you trying to show? So here on this page where we've got three different examples of three different ways you could format an education section, you're gonna see all of them have the degree the school, the location, and at least the expected graduation date. In that second example, you can see that this person included as a bullet point underneath that degree, the relevant courses that they took. If you just wanted to include these relevant courses, maybe um, in the skills that they're seeking listed on that job description, they say public finance skills. And you're like, great, I took a class that was literally called public financial management. I'm going to include that because the applicant tracking system, that scanner is gonna pull those exact words. Perfect. But maybe you wanna include a class because you wanna show policy expertise. So maybe you took a class that was about um, climate change policy. You could, list it, so you just include the title of the course there in your education section. Or if um, we advance to the next slide, this is gonna show actually some of the ways that you could format projects. So you might think about in my climate change policy class, I did a big project that was about a specific climate change policy. By including that, maybe the title of the project, and perhaps you put the title of the class after the project title, which is what you see in the formatting of that first example of projects. We've got a title followed by the course, and then the dates that you did that. That actually means more to an employer than just seeing a title of a class, because that's showing them what did you do? people are always gonna be more impressed with what did you do than just seeing a title of a class that you took. In that second example, this is another way that you could format projects. You can also see they chose not to have projects as a title. So maybe they were applying for a job that had research as one of those themes that came up. So instead of calling it projects, they actually called the section applied research to show that. They included the title of the project. And then instead of just saying the class that it was, they included instead the methodology um, that they did. So that's another way that you could format it. And then the one beneath that, 
again, this person chose to call this reports and memos as opposed to projects, as opposed to applied research, probably because that job description was talking about they needed somebody who could write reports and memos. So in that way, even the titles that you choose for your sections can be used and are a very easy thing to tweak that can again show how much of a match you are between what they're asking for and what you've done. That person chose this formatting to include the title and then just a brief description, which can be helpful because sometimes that also is an opportunity for you to go into a little bit of detail without having to squeeze it into an experience section. If we advance to the next slide, I also see a question, would it be okay to hyperlink projects in your resumes? Absolutely. If you have hyperlinks, definitely hyperlink it. That is a great idea, great example. So this comes from a full sample resume. This person chose to put a bunch of things into just one experience section as opposed to breaking them up. You can see that the first experience here, this is actually that student's capstone experience for the Evans School. They included, who is the capstone client, they gave themselves a job title, they were a graduate consultant, and then they used bullet points to tell me what did they actually do. They combined this experience with other things that they've done, so with an internship that they had, and then also volunteer service that they had, they served as a board fellow. So this is an example of you can combine a lot of different types of experiences into the same section. Again, you're always trying to think about what do I think is most important and most relevant that I have done that's going to help connect to this position, to this job. Okay, so this next slide, again, a lot of content here. It's more because I have three examples. So this bottom three bullet points, those are just examples. So organization of your resume is important. And also the way that you are describing what you've actually done is important. So again, really doing the work on that job description is gonna help you prioritize what do you need to be emphasizing. When you're writing a bullet point, you wanna think about how a bullet point can include these three general things, starting with a verb that is hopefully describing a skill. So this is something, use that skills list, use that verb list straight from the job description to really hone in on what skill did you use to do a certain task. This is a good place to show subject matter expertise. So you can see um, in red, some of the things that I identified as tasks were a stakeholder analysis, data visualizations, a communications plan, thinking about building relationships, working with partners in certain sectors. These are often things, those kind of like big picture themes that you're gonna see from that overview in a job description. So like big picture, what do they need somebody to be able to do? And then the blue, the skills, the verbs, those are more the vocabulary that I'm probably gonna mine from that responsibilities list. When you think about impact and outcome, you're not always going to have something that is a super clear numerical outcome of what you did. Um, and that's okay. So you can think about what is impact or outcome. You want to try to include these in as many of your bullet points as possible. And I also recognize it's not always possible to include it in every single line. But really thinking about for what purpose were you doing this work? So if you were doing um, an analysis, what is your hope that this analysis would be used for? Um, what is the purpose of building out a communications plan? Why were you focused on building community partnerships and really focused on building trusting relationships uh, with organizations? Anytime that you can quantify, it's gonna help show the scale and scope of what you did. So try to include ways that you can quantify. Quantifying um, can look like a lot of different things. It could be frequency, 
it could be size, it could be thinking about um, number of people served, size of a district, size of a state, um, across how many counties was your work thinking about? How frequently is this something that you revisit? How long were you working on this particular project? Was it a six month project? Was it a three month project? How many people were you working with? A team of six, a team of two. So there's a lot of things that you can quantify. So there's usually some type of number that you can come up with. And it doesn't always have to be something that's like a percentage increase or a dollar amount or a budget size. So if you have those numbers, those are great to share. Okay, so again, I'm going to pause for questions, also recognizing we've got 13 minutes left in this section and we do have a few other things to share. But I want to make sure, again, I know that was a lot of information. This is being recorded and we will share resources with you afterwards. Um, this is a point where I can come back to the question someone asked to repeat what I had said about international students and visa sponsorship. So if you are an international student and um, you're looking for a full time job and you would require that employer to be able to offer sponsorship to you to have that full time work authorization. Sometimes that is something that in job descriptions, employers will say this job is only open to US citizens or um, you must have work authorization without sponsorship. Sometimes that's there. Um, if you're looking for an internship, even if you're, if you're an international student, you don't really need to worry about that work authorization because your work authorization is tied to your degree program, your educational program, as opposed to the employer. Um, it's when you would be looking for full-time jobs if you don't have your permanent work authorization, that that is something that you would want to um, take a look at and see if it's already mentioned in the job description or if that might need to be a conversation that you have with the recruiter asking those questions. And that is something that when you come in for an individual appointment um, with your career advisor, we can definitely talk through how to have those conversations um, and how to translate some of the things that employers will have in their job descriptions. I'm not seeing other questions come through. So we're gonna go ahead uh, and keep moving for the sake of time. So at this point, Shahid is actually gonna go through this uh, resume checklist for you all. Awesome, uh, thanks so much, Shannon. And uh, what a presentation. I mean, there's a lot of uh, very useful information. So um, I'm just going to tie everything in, in one slide. So um, as Shannon mentioned, you know, sometimes it's just uh, very important to make sure you have the right email address uh, on your resume. That's really the main thing. And your contact number um, is the right contact number. Um, so that's really the main thing um, because you have done a lot of work on your resume. So you want to make sure that if they want to reach out to you, then they can and, you, and they have the right information. Um, but uh, just tying that all in to the purpose of the resume that Shannon mentioned, I know that, uh, you know, I did that mistake in my undergrad, even earlier, you know, career as well. It just, um, you write, um, and then, you know, there's different skills you highlight and, and projects and so on and so forth without really understanding the true purpose of the resume and Shannon again, just to you know uh, put importance to what she said is really there's only one purpose for your resume and that's to get an interview um, and I, I come from a talent acquisition background myself uh, so that's something um, that the recruiters always look for right so uh, another quick point on this is that there are two audiences for your resume one is a recruiter of course and the other is hiring manager and two are completely different right so uh, please try to understand both audiences. Going back to what Shannon mentioned, it's a marketing document. Um, so obviously, uh, you're writing for both. You know, you're writing for the gatekeeper, which is the recruiter, 
Um, and then once you pass that gatekeeper, then only you know hiring manager is going to see, and that's completely different audience, right? Um, so it all, all really helps if you keep that in mind. Uh, formatting and everything is is pretty basic, you know, keeping uh, the font the same, you know, on both pages, you're on your cover letter, so on and so forth. Um, and again, Shannon uh, has done a great job on different sections that you should have on action verbs. Uh, just on that too, uh, maybe it will help you to uh, kind of understand if you really do have two different audiences. So uh, maybe this bullet points uh, under expenses or whatever section you have, uh, write it with the hiring manager in mind, because those are technical things, right? That the recruiter may not even understand, but that is okay. So that may give you comfort knowing that you don't need to make that understandable to the recruiter because you know, that person is in talent acquisition, right? Not in that actual field. So feel free to really speak to terms that you know that hiring manager would understand, right? Because that, that's what you're writing for. And then at the top, of course, the page one of the resume, when Shen mentioned, and just make sure it's relevant, taking uh, some of the keywords, those are the things you're doing it for the recruiter. Because again, you know, five seconds, they scan it. Um, and then if they have, uh, you know, if you have what they're looking for, they're gonna push it forward. And again, just one analogy that always helps, uh, and it helped me personally, is that, you know, it, you just need to know if someone is asking for an apple, uh, then you give them the apple, right? You don't give them the orange, right? So that's where it comes, like you're looking at the job posting, and when you're customizing that section, just think about, like, they're really looking for this top three things, those top three things the applicant tracking system Shannon mentioned probably most likely will scan for. So if they're looking for an apple, just give them the exact apple they're looking for. Don't give them an orange because it's just going to be a mismatch, right? And then they're not going to move your resume forward to the hiring manager. So it always helps if you think it um, that way. And then of course, uh, spelling, grammar, you know, there's a Grammarly, I'm sure all of you know, is a very useful tool, um, you know, uh, feel free to use that. It has a free version as well. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Shannon for the next slide. Thanks, Shahid. And um, you may all have been able to tell, but Shahid is actually coming from a background of working in recruiting and HR with a local government. So a lot of you know what he was just emphasizing there, he's also drawing from experience uh, being that person. OK, so on this slide, we've got a couple of um, questions that we encounter fairly frequently. So this first one, should I add a photo on my resume? This is something that uh, may be fairly common across different cultures. Or what about graphics or a designed resume? So in regards to both of these questions, uh, we would encourage you away from that. So here in the American job search system, we do not want to see photos on resumes. That is not something that should be um, part of a hiring manager's decision about whether to hire you. So you don't want to include um, that photo. Graphics and a designed resume, while that may be something that if you were working within a creative field, they would encourage on your resume because it is an example of your skills related to the job that you're applying for. For these types of jobs, these policy related MPA related jobs, we do not recommend graphics or designed resumes. We know most of the employers in this field um, uh, are just really looking for that skill match. We also know that many employers use computer systems, applicant tracking systems, ATS, that may do a first scan over the resume to pull keywords, content, and skills that match that job description. Um, and graphics or templates uh, interfere with that, and so they'll miss a lot of your content. If you don't have a lot of experience in the field that you're trying to enter, um, hopefully you are pulling a lot of ideas from the examples we were giving, really thinking about how can you leverage your coursework? How can you think about projects? And how can you think about what you've been doing outside of work, outside of formal paid jobs that are really valuable experiences that you can include on a resume? Um, and if you come in and have a conversation with me or with Melanie, uh, we can help brainstorm and, and hopefully pull out some of those things. 
objective statements, love them or leave them. Forget objective statements, um, they're outdated and employer is going to assume your objective is to get the job, so you don't need to tell them that. Um, and when to stop including these various things on your resume. Honors, awards, GPA, really depends what's the relevance. I would say also depends what's the space situation that you have going on in your document. Um, if you're including those things, but having to leave off some other experience that's more skill driven, that's more impactful, then I would say remove the honors awards GPA. Um, short term roles or past jobs, again, I would say really think about how much space you have available. If you're including that, what do you have to leave off to create space? And then also how long ago was it? Don't need to really include anything else from high school. Um, undergraduate, you know, it depends how far away from undergraduate are you? And also, what have you been doing more recently that might supersede um, that experience that you don't need to include that? References are not something you need to include on your resume anymore. Um, employers will assume when they ask for reference, you will provide it, so you don't need to have that. In terms of a summary at the top of um, your resume that highlights skills and experiences, this is an optional section. Everyone has different opinions about it. Personally, I like summaries because I think that it is priming the reader. You are telling them from the very beginning, these are the important things about me. You can also make a summary uh, very much tailored to what is this job asking for. So your summary is as if you are writing, this is my summary of qualifications for this job based on what you have told me in the job description you are looking for. So that just depends. Um, really fast, there's a bunch of links here. We'll include all of this in a follow-up email. I dropped the link to the resume guide. You can also find those in all of your student portals. Um, APAM offers a series of virtual uh, professional development topics, including marketing your skills as a PhD right for me, thinking about fellowships. If you are considering applying for federal jobs, everything that we just went over is still true, but there's more. Um, and so that is something that we can definitely talk about in a conversation. There are also several other upcoming events um, on the next slide. Um, Melanie and Shahid and I will be leading a session next Monday about um, career design. How do you come up with a career plan and next steps? Um, the Career and Internship Center also offers a lot of workshops. And next week, there is a special workshop specifically for um, international graduate students that um, UW Circle is offering. So highly recommend for graduate student or for international students on the call, but maybe something that you attend. And the last slide just has our survey link as well as how you can follow up. I see uh, if you need to sign off. Also, I know we're right at time. Um, we'll stick around if you're available and that way we can get to additional questions that you may have. Sorry, that was so rushed right at the end. Okay, I see a question from, 